tonight, session 35, Jesus Crucified. Yeah. Now, you have to understand that there are uh, several teachings that are out there that goes into great detail. I mean, become very detailed as to all of the things that Jesus Christ went through, but 90% of what they're teaching is not in the Bible. Mm -hmm. What they're doing is extrapolating it from history and what it is that, that, that the Romans did during those times as far as the crucifixion. The crucifixion was bad enough. Yes. But you're going to notice that the Gospels do not dwell on the, the passion so much. It was bad enough and it's, it's something that we should not go lightly on. But it is something that the Gospels don't concentrate on. They put, don't put that down as their main point. It was just part of the thing that Jesus had to fulfill as part of prophecy. And being crucified was part of prophecy. And that's kind of how they handle it. He was crucified, and that's about all they say. Now, we give a little more detail as far as in this study. But we're going to travel on through... And starting with last session, Jesus was brought before Pontius Pilate, who is the Roman prefect of the region, by the Jewish leadership to be sentenced to crucifixion. The Jews found this was not going to be as easy as they had hoped. Pilate was not fooled by their, by their feigned protest or charges of political upheaval brought against Jesus. To ensure he was right in his judgment, Pilate sent Jesus to Herod Antipater, who is the Tetrarch of Galilee, when he learned he was of Galilee. When Jesus was brought before Herod, he was only interested in seeing a miracle performed by him. Herod has no other interest in spiritual or religious matters brought by the Jewish leadership. Jesus, however, gave him no satisfaction in what he sought and was rather disappointed. He sent Jesus back to Pilate, mocked as being a king, but nothing warranting further review under the law. Herod was pleased that Pilate had considered him in this matter and put old differences aside to become friends and allies. Pilate was only interested in one of the charges of the three, brought by the Jewish leadership. Is he a king as he claims? Jesus made it clear that his kingdom was not of this world, but also claimed that a kingdom of this world was not for this time, meaning there will be a future kingdom to come. Beyond this, Jesus stopped answering to any questions. Pilate judges Jesus to be innocent of all charges brought against him, as well did Herod, but the Jews would not have it. Pilate would meet their demands or they made it clear he would regret having crossed them. Pilate then tries to release Jesus as part of his customary release of prisoners during the feasts. He offered them Jesus, an innocent man, or Barabbas, a vile murdering criminal. The Jews demanded Barabbas be freed and Jesus be crucified. Pilate, now shouting with disdain at this unruly mob, asked why he should crucify their king. The leader shouted back, we have no king but Caesar, condemning themselves right there. And you are not his friend, telling him, telling Pilate that you are not Caesar's friend. If you refuse to crucify Jesus, who claims to be a king above Caesar. Pilate, attempting to exonerate himself, used a Jewish ritual of washing his hands of the matter, said the blood be on your heads, in which they replied, let it be on our heads and our children's. Pilate is without excuse. He is more interested in his own peace of mind than in doing what is right. By his own words, he is sending an innocent man to be crucified. Amen. Amen. Jesus crucified. Picking up in Matthew 27, 32. 
And he, Jesus, bearing his cross, went forth. And as they came out, wherever it was that they came, it doesn't really specify where they came out from other than from the uh, place where they had flogged him. They found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus. And on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Some religions teach that Simon took Jesus' place and died on the cross in his stead based on the teachings of Balasides, a second century Gnostic heretic. Gnosticism means having secret knowledge. In other words, he was teaching that he had received the secret knowledge from God and then was passing it on to them. Well, one of his teachings, of course, is heretical, that he was saying that this Simon is the one who took Jesus' place. Not much is known of Simon, but his two sons afterwards become well-known Christians. And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Jesus urges the women of Jerusalem to mourn their own fate and the fate of their children more than his. They were weeping over the injustice of one man's death, but he was grieving over the coming destruction of a nation. For behold, the days are coming in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren, and the wounds that never bear, and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in a dry? Jewish women consider barrenness a curse, and children a blessing. Jesus announced that in the future the opposite would be true. They would see their children suffer and wish they had never been born. The context of Jesus' quotation is out of Hosea 10.8 and is a passage describing Israel's idolatry and God's judgment of her for it. Jesus speaking on God's judgment, the people will call on the mountains and hills to hide them from God's wrath. That's uh, it, you know, of course, Revelation hadn't even been written yet, but it's a quote that you will find in Revelation. The tribulation judgments on Jerusalem is now in view here. The destruction by the Romans in 70 A.D. would only be a foretaste of the terrifying judgments still to come. Evidently, a proverbial saying, the green tree stands for good conditions resulting from God's blessing, and the dry tree for bad conditions resulting from divine judgment. If Romans condemned to death one they admitted to be innocent, which is Jesus, the green tree, how would God deal in the future with those whom he finds guilty, Israel being the dry tree? Verse 33, And when they were come to a place called Golgotha, the, world, the word Golgotha is a Greek transliteration of the Aramaic, Aramaic Golgotha, meaning skull. And Calvary comes from the Latin Calva, which means skull. So in both places where it talks about Golgotha or Calvary, they're both talking about the same place. That is to say, a place of a skull. They gave him vinegar, which is actually wine to drink, mingled with gall, and it's actually myrrh. And when he had tasted, he would not drink. And there were also two other criminals led with him to be put to death. The women of Jerusalem tried to give Jesus some wine to drink, and to which they had added myrrh to decrease his pain. This sour wine mixed with gall or myrrh was a drug to kill pain because the wine that had become bitter is more alcoholic. Ooh, yeah. Well, what can I say? It, it is actually more alcoholic and then you put the myrrh in there, which is the bitters, it helps to dull any pain. And so that's what they were trying to give him. 
Jesus refused it because he chose to endure the cross fully conscious. Matthew wrote gall because of the myrrh's bitter taste and to make the fulfillment of Psalm 69 clear. The Romans reserved crucifixion for the worst criminals from the lowest classes of society. Roman citizens were exempt from crucifixion unless Caesar himself ordered it. For the Jews, crucifixion was even more horrible because it symbolized a person dying under God's curse. That's out of Deuteronomy 21. Israel's leaders hung up those who died under God's curse for others to see and learn from. However, Jesus bore God's curse for the sins of humankind so we would not have to experience that curse. Now, Jesus placed on the cross, and they crucified him and took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam. This was a very expensive coat because it had no seam. In other words, it was one cloth that was woven. And also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it. In other words, they didn't want to tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. The executioners took the criminals' clothes for themselves. In Jesus' case, they cast lots for his robe, fulfilling Psalm 22. And it was the third hour, the third hour of the day would be 9 a.m. And sitting down, they watched him there. Sometimes people took criminals down from their crosses to prevent them from dying. The soldiers guard Jesus to prevent him, prevent this from happening, and no one rescued him. Some false religions teach that God took Jesus to heaven before he died, replacing him with Judas and that he will come back to earth one day to finish his work. So there's many different teachings that are out there. You know what the truth is because this is what the Bible teaches. This is what God's word teaches. Jesus in his suffering was slapped in the face before Annas and spat on and beaten before Caiaphas and the council. Pilate scourged him and the soldiers smote him and before they led him to Calvary, the soldiers mocked him and beat him with a rod. He suffered much for us. But you notice none of the Gospels dwell on the suffering, nor do they go into great detail as modern teachers do. Scourging and crucifixion is horrendous and not to be made light of, but it's not the main point. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross and set it up over his head his accusation written. This is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. That's kind of what it would look like. And Pilate was a Jew? Pilate is a Roman. Herod was the Jew. He was mocking Jesus. He was mocking Jesus. Well, so did Herod. And so were all the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was near to the city. And it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin to make sure that everybody could read it. Then said to the chief priest of the Jews to Pilate, write not the king of the Jews, but that he said that I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. In other words, tough, I'm not changing it. Then there were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left, and Jesus in the midst, and the scripture was fulfilled which said he was numbered with the transgressors. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, talking about those that are crucifying him. Jesus hung between two men who wanted to bring in Israel's kingdom through violent action against Israel's enemies contrary to God's will. That's talked about in Isaiah 53. In other words, they were probably a part of the Barabbas group 
the ones that were rising up against the Roman authorities. That's the reason why Barabbas was in the prison to begin with. And they were completely shocked that he would actually, that the people actually cried out for him because he's the one who had created so many problems murdering and killing people indiscriminately. But they got their way. Jesus and his mother. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, who was Salome, Salome Mary and Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, I don't know why John talks about himself like that, but that's, that's how he refers to himself. He said to his mother, woman, behold your son. He's not talking about himself. Then said he to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. In other words, he looked down on his mother and said, mother, you know, and he said, woman, this is now your son. And that to the disciple, he said, this is now your mother. And he took care of her from that time on. Jesus is mocked. He's been being mocked. And the people stood beholding, and they, passed by, and they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, you that destroy the temple, still mocking him, you that destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you be the son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priest mocked him with the scribes and elders said, he saved others, let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen of God, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let, the, let Christ, the king of Israel, now come down from the cross and we will believe him. Yeah, just continuing to dig their graves a little deeper. He trusted in God, the priest still talking. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now. Let God deliver him if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him, offering him vinegar and saying, if you be the king of the Jews, save yourself. The thieves also which were crucified with him reviled him cast the same in his teeth, simply meaning they agreed with the mob, casting everything into his teeth, the same things that they were saying. The religious leaders threw doubt on Jesus' healing ministry by claiming that he could not even heal his own condition. Of course, Jesus could have saved himself from his suffering on the cross, but he could not have done so and provided salvation for humankind. They claimed that God, God's failure to rescue Jesus proved that God did not delight in him. Jesus claimed to be God's son was therefore pretentious in their sight. Even one condemned with him reviled him at claiming to be the son of God when he would not even save any of them. However, one of the criminals, which was hanged, uh, that railed, railed on him, saying, if you are Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, do not you fear God, seeing you are in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, in other words, he's admitting we sinned. We did wrong, and we indeed justly are being crucified, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing amiss. And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, verily I say to you, today shall you be with me in paradise. Amen. That means he's gonna see him today in Abraham's bosom. Jesus gives up the ghost. Remember, Jesus didn't die. He wasn't killed. They did the crucifixion. They did all these horrible things to him. But it was Jesus who had to give up. He's the one who had to give his spirit. No one could take it from him. That's in the gospel. He even tells you, no one can take my life from me. I give it freely. Now from the sixth hour, which is noon, there was darkness 
over all the land to the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Can you imagine be conti being continuously in contact, having contact with the Spirit of God, being on you continuously, and then suddenly having that jerked away from you? That's exactly what Jesus Christ is suffering right now. Because God is not going to look, on, look upon sin because right now he is the sacrifice for all humankind and all of the sin of mankind is now coming upon that body of his. Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, this man calls for Elias, which is Elijah. After this, Jesus knowing, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished that scripture might be fulfilled, speaking out of Psalm 69, said, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. The rest said, let him be. Let us see whether Elijah will come and save him, still mocking Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, he said, Father, it is finished. Into your hands I, I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he bowed his head and yielded up the ghost. He has now passed his spirit to Father. Of course, we know first it descends into hell. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in two from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. This is the heavy curtain which divided the holy of holies from the holy place. From top to bottom shows this is an act of God and it is intended to be symbolic. That's talked about in Hebrews. The earth shook, not an ordinary earthquake. When he gave up the ghost, I mean, it shook the earth, it rent that veil. When it rent that veil, God came out to be with his people. There's no longer anything that comes between man and God. We have direct connections now. Jesus' side is pierced. The Jews, therefore, because it was prep the preparation... In other words, it's the day before Sabbath and it's almost time that they have to start making all the preparations because you do all your cooking the day before Sabbath because no cooking allowed on the Sabbath and no other things to be done on the Sabbath. That's the day of rest. So that's the reason why it's called the preparation. That the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day. For that Sabbath day was a high day because it fell during Passover week. Besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. And that some want to break their legs because it'll actually speed up their death. Breaking the legs is actually merciful to them. The Mosaic law instructed the Jews to allow no one to remain hanging on a tree overnight because this would defile the land. That's the reason why they were asking for the bodies to be taken down. Otherwise, the Romans just leave them up there until they rot. Then came the soldiers and broke the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they broke not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knows that he said true that you might believe. And that little saying right there, he's actually talking about himself. He, John, saw it. In other words, he was a witness to what was going on here. And his record is true. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. That's talked about in Exodus, Numbers, and Psalms. The first two specify that the Israelites were not to break the bones of the Passover lambs. And again, another scripture said, said they shall look on him whom they pierced. The prophecy in view is clearly out of Zechariah. 
and also Revelation 1.7. Jesus quoted this verse in the Olivet Discord as, of course as well out of uh, Matthew chapter 24. And again, another scripture said, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Roman centurion's confession. Now when the centurion and they, his soldiers, they were with him, watching Jesus, saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, saw the earthquake and those things that were done. They feared greatly. The soldiers feared greatly. He glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. Truly this man was the Son of God. Now, whether he's saying that out of superstition or actually looking at it and starting to believe, it doesn't actually say, but I would say that he's probably headed in the right direction right now. And all the people that came together to that site, beholding the things that were done, smote their breasts and returned, and all his acquaintance and many women were there beholding afar off which, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him. Among which was Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of Zebedee's children and Salome, who also when he was in Galilee followed him and ministered to him. And many, many other women which came up with him to Jerusalem. So there was a slew of ladies that had come up to see what was going on. Jesus is laid in the tomb. When the even was come, because it was the preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, remember their days start in the evening at six o'clock, so this is right around between three to six. There came a rich man of Arimathea, a city of the Jews named Joseph. And he was a good man and a just. The same had not consented to the council. In other words, he was part of the council, but he did not consent. He did not vote that Jesus should be crucified. An honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, who himself also was Jesus' disciple, but secretly for fear of the Jews. He went to Pilate and begged, asked, for the body of Jesus. And Pilate marveled if he were already dead. And calling to him the centurion, he asked him whether he had been any while dead. And when he knew it of the centurion, then Pilate gave leave, which meant granted the request and commanded the body to be delivered. And he bought fine linen and took him down. And when Joseph had taken the body, and there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound. That's a lot of myrrh and aloes. They wrapped it, they wrapped it, talking about the body, in a clean linen cloth with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury helps to embalm the body with spices, but they could only do a partial job because the time was so short. Excuse me, that's not Joseph, is dead. No. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new sepulcher, a tomb, and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock wherein never man before was laid, and he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. And the women also, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, which came with him from Galilee, followed after and beheld the sepulcher and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. Guards are posted at the tomb. Now the next day that followed, the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together to Pilate saying, Sir, we remember that the, that the deceiver said while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command therefore that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, those thieving devils. 
and say to the people, he is risen from the dead, so that the last error shall be worse than the first. In other words, they got rid of him because they considered him to be a rebel and a problem. Well, they don't want the people to run away and say that he has risen from the dead, you know, saying that they, he had, they had stolen the body and done this. Then the, first, then the last error will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a watch. In other words, use your own guards. The temple priest had their own watch, their own men that were guards and took care of di different things such as this for them. Go your way and make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. We got plenty of time. Now for the good part. The resurrection now, the accounts in the four Gospels are all over the map. And if you read each one of them individually, you would say, well, there's a lot that they seem to conflict with each other. But you have to study them. And you'll find that there's absolutely no conflict in them because everything that happened in there were in a certain order. They just didn't list them all. And, and there, you have to take all four of the Gospels together and start piecing them together. That's what I did. Now then, it may not be exact, but you'll get the idea. Matthew 28, in the end of the Sabbath, in other words, after the Sabbath is over, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had brought sweet spices that they might come to see the sepulcher and anoint him. Before sunrise, the women of Christ had begun preparations, and as the sun dawned, they set out to complete the proper preparation of their Messiah's body to complete the embalming process. Long before this, however, sometime in the night, and behold, there was a great earthquake. In other words, it shook pretty hard. That's when Jesus was suddenly resurrected and came out of that tomb. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. Well, my angel didn't turn out too good, but it looks all right. And for fear of him, the keepers, the guards that were there, remember the watch, the guards of the night watch did shake and became as dead men. In other words, it frightened them so bad they passed out. An angel had announced the incarnation. In other words, there were angels that came and announced the birth of Jesus Christ and now an angel announces the resurrection. The angel rolled away the stone to admit witnesses not to allow Jesus to escape, for he had already departed from the tomb. The women now coming to the garden, and they said among themselves, who shall roll away, us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was great, it was a huge stone. They wondered how they were going to get that huge stone moved when they discovered to their amazement it is already rolled away, and they don't see the angel yet. And then the angel responded, now he's talking to them, and said the, to the women, fear not yourselves, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in long white garment. And they were astonished and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And he said to them, be not astonished. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is risen, he is not here. Behold the place where, you, where they laid him. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands 
of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And go quickly and tell his disciples and Peter that he is risen from the dead and behold, he goes before you into Galilee. There shall you see him as he said to you. Behold, I have told you. And they remembered his words. But as you'll see going through here, they still have a problem with the faith, with the believing. And they departed quickly and fled from the, fled from the sepulcher with fear and great joy. Neither said they anything to any man and did run to bring his disciples' word. In other words, they didn't say anything to anybody along the way. They were headed straight to the, to the disciples and told all these things to the 11 and to all the rest. In other words, they didn't keep it just to the 11. All the rest of the disciples that had been following Jesus as well, they told. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and other women that were with them, which told these things to the apostles, and their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Oh, you know how women are. <laughs> That's all right, I looked to make sure there was no weapons. Then Mary Magdalene came to Simon. <laughs> yes, you do have that weapon. Then Mary Magdalene came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, to the other disciple, John, whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher and we know not where they have laid him. Now Peter, this, this got them to thinking, okay, let's go check this out. Peter therefore went forth and ran to the sepulcher and that other disciple, John, and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. John outran him. And he, John, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then comes Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and sees the linen clothes lie and the napkin that was about his head not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Peter, wondering in himself at that which was to come, was come to pass. He was thinking on this. He's just not sure of exactly what he's believing right now. Then went in also the other disciple, John, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. That's why Jesus loved John, because John had a childlike faith where he believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, in other words, meaning they still did not understand it. They knew the scriptures, but they still didn't have a complete understanding that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own home. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and sees two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said to her, woman, why weep you? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why weep you? Whom seek you? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, sir, if you have borne him hence from here, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned herself and said to him, Rabbani, which is to say master, Jesus said to her, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I ascend to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples as they mourned and wept that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. And they, when they heard it, that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. 
they still haven't taken that leap of faith. John part of them. Well, John, well, John, remember, this is all the apostles. John believed. But these, most of these that they're talking to right now, they don't believe. Remember doubting Thomas. He said he wouldn't believe until he could stick his fingers in the holes of his hand. Why couldn't Mary touch him? Was there... Because he had not ascend, because he hadn't ascended yet to cover the mercy seat with the blood. He couldn't touch him as if he did. Correct. Okay. But there are some that come later that do. So that means he had already ascended. Yeah, it don't take a spirit long to get to heaven, take care of business, and come back. Jesus proves that on many occasions during the 40 days that he walks the earth. Jesus now appears to many. Now, sometime later, the other group of women that had held their peace at first have now decided to bring the news. And as they went to tell the disciples... Behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail! And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus to them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brothers that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. He keeps having to repeat himself. Remember, I told you I'd meet you in Galilee. So he keeps trying to tell them, Get them to go to Galilee. But now they grabbed his feet here. So he's been to the seat. He's already been up to the mercy seat and put the blood and now has come back. And remember, he's in a glorified body now, the same kind of body we're going to have when we get resurrected. Amen? Amen. The graves are burst open. Few people talk about this. While all of this is going on, another event is taking place at the same time. This is talked about in Matthew 27, verses 52 and 53. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of saints which once slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection after his resurrection Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection so after he is resurrected all these graves suddenly burst open and all these saints come out and went into the holy city of course is Jerusalem and appeared to many now remember, this is at the time of the Passover, the feast, and all the other things that are going on. There's literally millions of people that's in the area. So you can imagine when these people came out of the graves and was mingling among the people in Jerusalem, most of the people probably didn't pay any attention to them until they came to relatives. Can you imagine you start seeing your aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, mothers, and dads that have passed on before you suddenly coming up to greet you and say hello? I'll guarantee you there was a lot of people that started believing that day. But little is said other than this, and it doesn't say anything about what happens to them after this point. The only thing that I can come up with in my own way is the fact that when Jesus, after the 40 days, he lifts up and goes to heaven, so do they. They're not going to have, because we only die once. It says so in the Bible. It is given to man to die once. So they've already died and been in Abraham's bosom. Those are all the ones, those are the captives that he set free. Remember, he went into Abraham's bosom and preached to them. That's in some of the epistles that you need, need to read. But he preached to them, and then they believed, and then once he come up out of there, so did they. There is no longer Abraham's bosom. All, all of hell now took and filled in the entire portion that was Abraham's bosom. Okay? Am I messing with everybody's head? Well, Abraham's bosom was not hell, right? It was down there, but it was not a part of hell. There was a, ca there was a huge pit that separated them. That's the story of Lazarus. Lazarus, correct, and the rich man. Lazarus was in the bosom. Correct. And the rich man was on the other side of the pit in hell. Now when they were gone, when the last of the disciples finally left the tomb, behold, some of the watch, the guards, came into the city and showed, meaning they reported to the chief priest all the things that were done. 
And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they all came together, all the elders and the chief priests, and they took counsel. They gave large money to the soldiers. Large means they made those soldiers wealthy. Why? Because they were to lie. Saying, say you, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. In other words, if it comes to the governor's ears that you were asleep while you were supposed to be guarding, then you're probably going to lose your life. But they will talk to the governor and it won't be any problem. He will secure you so there won't be anybody dying. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is still commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Amen. Amen. So we have much to be thankful for. He is the first fruits. He was resurrected. And we know that we're in the end days now. We know that the end times have come because all the things that were written in the Bible about the end times are all happening at the same time. Not just one or two things. Everything is happening at the same time. So we know that we're at the end of the church age and it's time for Christ to come and take us off this earth. And when he does, we will be in those new bodies. And then we will be coming back with him to rule and reign. Amen? Amen. All right. We have much to be thankful for because we do know that through Jesus Christ we do have salvation. Through Jesus Christ we have a better future definitely coming around the corner and it's almost that time. Amen? Let's take communion so that we can keep in remembrance everything that Jesus has done for us. Thank you. There is power in the blood, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs>